and welcome back to the Genesis Designs and Model Craft Bench and to Foxy Killer Part 9. So this will probably be the last part in, uh, of the build instalment series. I think the part there will be a part 10 but it will be a, a final reveal sort of deal and a bit of a review of the build and a chat about what's good and what isn't and so on and so forth but anyhow for the time being I'm this may be a bit bitty because I'm sort of dotting and diving backwards and forwards with bits and pieces here uh, as you can probably imagine uh, so last time we looked at washing as you can see now the whole thing has been done um, this isn't yet finished weathering as such but it's certainly getting there I just need to add on top of this the sort of footprint style effects and some, some smut here and there uh, especially sort of up here on, on the finning around these exhaust cans and thrust, res thrust reverser buckets there will be a bit more soot type stuff going on there but as you can see we've still got a bit of a sheen here um, now I'm I'm really not a fan of very flat models um, in terms of the matteness that is rather than relief um, I, f I feel it well it looks dull and lifeless really um, uh, real aircraft are very rarely really really flat in terms of their finish uh, even those that are matte are generally quite smooth and have a bit of a sheen here and there so I'm not a fan however in this case a very very matte finish is entirely accurate uh, this was a, a matte semi permanent finish which was then baked in very hot sun and covered in all sorts of filth so a very matte finish is entirely appropriate in this case so this is the the final finish on this slat and it, it does still have a tiny bit of sheen but it's exacerbated by the sort of the lighting here to be honest uh, the final finish is uh, VMS matte as opposed to satin anyway enough of that uh, I am at this point working on the details and, and playing catch up in a way I'm very guilty I always do this with jet models of leaving the cockpit and ejector seats until the end I probably shouldn't do it to myself but I do it every time <laughs> uh, so initially then here I have demasked the cockpit area I've removed the main canopy which is now demasked and it's here that needs a load of work doing on it um, but I fitted for real this front windscreen and I'm praying that this will come out on camera um, the front instrument panel and combing is in place it, it isn't coming out on camera fantastic let's go away there we go I'll have to make do with a slightly longer angle but that is all now fitted that combing is in place it's painted with matte black washed with black believe it or not that works quite well and with dusty sort of things and then I've used black oils to bring out some areas which you can just see through the shine of that transparency to make it look as though the dust has been rubbed away I then spent some time on these cockpit sill areas here you can see they're yellow at the moment that's Tamiya XF4 so that's representing the initial sort of chromate primer finish but what I've done is added some thin plastic card to represent and it is only a representation the canopy seal area basically and then I added some sort of flat pieces at the back right in that back corner there to represent where the canopy opening actuators pop through it's not much but it's just enough I added the resin uh, this sort of in, inside half of this is the resin part that was added on and then the canopy seal detail is added onto the top and the front part of the where it meets up with the canopy was all integrated and that was all done with sort of tiny pieces of plastic card and stretch sprue uh, at great expense of time this is the observer's instrument panel not yet completely finished but we're getting there hand painted all the sort of black parts of the black box boxes mostly in Tamiya XF85 rubber black uh, but the odd bit picked out in X18 which is really obviously a different shade of black especially to the naked eye that's had a little gentle wash of uh, Tamiya actually 
panel line accent colour in black again. So you use an off black paint and then a black wash and it kind of does highlight the depth areas quite nicely, believe it or not. Um, and then the dust wash has sort of popped out the high areas a little bit. Um, I still have to detail paint all that wiring and what have you and the buttons on the actual instrument panel. But it's starting to look quite nice and when it's put into position here in the cockpit area it is, it is beginning to busy things up quite nicely, thank you. Uh, it's starting to look quite convincing. Next step from here I'm going to add some black paint and start chipping and weathering away at the cockpit sill area. But so far so good. Okay, been working on the ejection seats um, today. Just got the base colours on them here. Uh, no detail painting as yet really. Painted the whole lot grey initially uh, and then the yellow areas and the, and the red areas for the labels were undercoated with white really not good at going backwards here to get everything central in the picture um, and the yellow and the red put on and then the seat cushion colours I've done some blending and shading on that underneath seat cushion but the, the sort of uh, main seat cushion not yet I will be doing that and the head box next um, and I'm going to be making some harness straps because these seats are from the uh, cockpit set, these are not the seats from the kit, the brass and seats. I ended up I had three sets of seats to choose from. Uh, an Aero Club pair from way back when. Um, the ones from this Airs cockpit and of course the ones that came with the kit. In the end I decided that the ones I prefer the most are the ones from the Airs cockpit but the downside is that they do not have moulded in seat belts. Now I know some people don't like moulded in seat belts and that's fine, I understand that. Um, but when with jet plane seats I do not like photo etched belts. So yeah, the cockpit set comes with this little fret. There's not that little to be fair, there's a fair bit on there. Um, including harness straps uh, built to be built up in many layers as shown here to form the sort of the harness arrangement which is quite complicated as it always is with with ejection seats on jets or at least more modern ones they are quite complex creatures when it comes to the harness um, there's a photograph from my reference time so you can see there the big green part it's not actually a cushion it's kind of like it forms a sort of a backpack which is attached to the parachute and that's the piece that I've started painting in its base colours, uh, as you've seen. So to that I have to add all of that harnessness uh, and the leg straps as well, the leg restraint straps. Um, the centre sort of crotch strap, if you like, of the harness is there. That is as yet not painted any colour, that's still grey. Um, but ra rather than building up these complicated photo etch according to this instructions, I'm actually going to make them out of lead foil and probably use the buckles, cut the buckles out of these, use lead foil because that way there's two things I can do. I can pose them more realistically and make each seat slightly different. Um, but I think that the photo etch straps, even in 48th scale, for, for something like this, as you can maybe pick up on from the photograph I just showed you, they're a bit thin um, and they just don't drape and fold in a way that suggests webbing to me. You can kind of get away with it or I'm happy to get away with it on sort of World War II fighters and subjects because the straps in use on those, a lot of them, were really stiff. Um, certain harnesses are really stiff kind of thick webbing so the photo etch isn't a bad representation to be fair. Anyway I digress. Uh, the seats are ongoing. That's as far as I've got so far. Uh, and because I have, I used a Payne's Grey, I actually mixed Payne's Grey oil uh, and some dust coloured oil together to make a dark blue grey wash which was put on to the sides of the seats and that needed time to dry so I went and started on the canopy. So the outside is all painted obviously. 
uh, but the inside has to be detailed uh, and painted because it will be open I want to paint the inside separately you can see that I, I did take the time to paint it grey before I painted it sand and it's been painted black in between the two um, but I want to add some framework and also these demist ducting ducts to add from the kit um, and I'm looking at it and I, so I thought well I'll mask the MDC cord because the canopy had I say had because it's gone now I moulded in MDC cord that's the sort of the wiggle the wiggly thing that you see running down the canopy that's actually a tiny explosive device which is there to shatter the perspex these are really thick in real life they're properly sort of this thick um, so you don't want to be getting ejected into it because it's going to give you quite the knock on your bonds and uh, kill you a little bit so the cord is sequenced to fire just before the seat does to shatter the canopy so that you can fly through it in complete safety um, but I didn't like it I couldn't mask it up nicely and when looking at it closely enough to mask it you could see that it was not consistent in its size as it went along so simply won't do so I decided to make a new detonation cord out of wire which meant removing the one that was moulded in which I have done uh, at great expense <laughs> in time and effort so that was scraped away from the inside and this detritus you see here is is what I was using so I used the curved number 15 blade end of to carefully scrape the cord away I do it that way because the blade will only touch the raised portion as long as you can hold it in a good angle inside the canopy there it will only touch the bit you want to remove so you're not removing extra material around it which you would if you tried to sand it so I scraped it until it was flush with the curved blade then I hit it with this medium coarse sanding stick everybody cringed you have to go at it with something initially with something that's coarse enough to get it flat and to remove the marks that the scalpel leaves because it leaves these tiny kind of transverse striations where you've scraped it you need to be able to get rid of them so you have to start with something coarse enough to do that hence this uh, I then used 800 grit wet and dry now although these three pieces of wet and dry are all 800 grit they have varying degrees of newness so this one listen is quite fresh this one less so and this one less so again you can both feel and hear the difference fingertips are amazing at picking up on stuff like this so this is nearly new this is probably half worn and this is basically worn out these three were then used in sequence to remove the scratches that this left uh, and then the good old tries out this is a fresh piece of tries out it does cut really remarkably well given that it's only 3000 grit it cuts incredibly well when it's fresh so then that and then the polishing sticks now these are all I need to get some more actually they're all a bit manky but these are flory model uh, polishing sticks they come as a two-sided thing you've got this sort of pale green on one side and the white on the other and this is so smooth um, in action you obviously use the green side first so after Trizac green side of this then the white side to buff it and that will get you to a point where your canopy is almost clear and especially if you're doing the outside of a canopy it can pretty much suffice at that because it's the inside and it's difficult to really get in there and get it nice I then used uh, some Brasso on a cutting bud be careful if you're going to use Brasso on canopies okay uh, test it on a bit of sprue because the solvents in this could very easily actually mar the canopy and make it worse than it was when you started it's a bit of Brasso on a cotton bud and then finally some wax now there are lots of um, excuse the lol worthy name of this wax it's not my fault okay it came like this um, there are proprietary model modeling polishes around and out there and this in fact did come from um, heroboy.com zero paints over in uh, Cheltenham 
or is it Gloucester? One of the two. Um, so yeah, you, you can get proprietary sort of model model polishes, but you don't need to. Uh, car wax. This is car noble wax with coconut oil in it. Uh, car waxes, good quality car waxes will do this. But again, check it on something spare. Check it on an, an extra piece of sprue or a light or a canopy that you're not using because again, some vehicle polishes do have some fairly heavy duty solvents in them. Uh, and they may damage the canopy. This one doesn't, but it doesn't cut either. This is this is only used to give that final glazed finish. Uh, you won't get any kind of tea cut effect out of this particular one because there aren't any additives in it. So there you go. That's how we did that, and that's how it's come back to this. And as you can probably tell, it's quite satisfactory. Now the sanding process was such, and because of the shape, I don't have particularly large fingers and. This is an advantage in these cases. I appreciate that some of you with bigger hands are going to struggle with this, but by the time that's sanded out, effect, essentially the whole thing was sanded. And that was beneficial because there is a moulding sort of blemish along the side and it did make that somewhat better as there is also one at the rear. And again, that did improve it. So here we go. So that's that. Removed the MDC, polished the canopy back up, and then to make a new MDC, I made and template. So before I sanded off that detail I made a pattern from it and then out of tape just basically held it up to the light with tape on the outside of the canopy and drew along the line that I could see then cut the tape and a piece of plastic card to match that shape and then to make the actual piece of wire, here's one I already made, this is for the rear part uh, very simply use your lead wire this is lead wire, sorry. Lead wire is super easy to form, but it's also super easy to deform. So it has its uh, plus and minus points for stuff like this. Um, if you're very, very careful, it will work. If you can't be careful, then use a uh, copper wire instead, which will hold its form a little bit better. But very simply, you can just form it around this former, I suppose you could call that. To bring out the shape and it's infinitely repeatable so if I mess it up a couple of times before I get the two canopy cords fitted it's no big drama because I can just make some more exactly the same so there you go bit of work on the canopy bit of work on the seats alrighty then you join us now uh, with a glimpse into the chaos that results when I actually start doing some work I have learned over the years to be a bit tidier about things keep my desk a bit clearer but as you can see once I start actually getting on with anything, it, it rapidly encroaches and you end up with quite a small area to, to work in. It's just one of those things. I'm no different to anyone else. Um, so the seats, just a quick quick look at the seats. So this is how they started. This is the uh, Airs resin ejection seat and it's really beautiful as you can see. Lovely detail, pretty much accurate. I've painted it in dark sea grey and varying shades of green. The sort of um, stencil stickers and whatnot are just painted squares. They're not, they're not detailed. They're, I think the aftermarket are missing a trick with um, ejection seat stencil sets. I think that's a thing that could be a seller. Anyway, I said I was going to do the harnesses myself because I'm not a big fan of photo etch seat straps at the best of times, but particularly not on jet seats. I'll just quickly show you my reference image again. You can see there how they drape and they fall and they fold. Photo which does not represent that oh well in my opinion. So I've used dead foil for the most part with a few parts of the photo etched straps. So here you can see I've got the lead foil head, head box straps already fitted on here. And then this is my finished seat. Just hoping against hope that the camera picks this up something like well. Just mess with the lights, there you go. So those harness straps are a combination of lead foil and the photo actually sort of supplied with the air's cockpit set. I'm quite happy with it. I think it looks really quite nice. And it recreates the sort of three-dimensional effect of a real strap much better than the purely photo etch would. 
the negative G or the leg restraint, sorry, the leg restraint cords there, I've used lead wire for. One of them's draped over the side of the seat, the other one is plugged in. So the materials used then, lead foil, this is lead foil, super pliable, relatively thick actually. You can, I think, get thinner foil than this, but I don't have currently. The only bit I have is this bit that will be removed before flight tags. I do need to look into getting some more, but this is Belinden. Belinden Productions lead foil. I don't know if it's still available in this form. I haven't got a clue. I've had this for a long time and this is all I've got left now. It is, it is ru running low, but I only use it for really for remove before flight tags and seat straps and the odd very small sort of tarpaulin effecty type thing. So it does last quite well. The wire I'm using is lead wire from Plus Model. This is still broadly available. Uh, it should be easy enough to pick up and you can get it in all of these sizes quite happily and it is quite nice stuff again super pliable and easy to work with you can make it drape into a shape and it will sit there unlike copper wire and things which can be quite awkward to shape uh, this is much easier so there you go I've mounted the seats on a stick obviously whilst I'm working on them and then importantly you may note that this one has been extended underneath compared to this one I simply sawed them off the pore block but when fitting them into the model I've noted that they sit a little low so I've added a piece of plastic card to the bottom so that when they're popped into the into the cockpit that is going to it is going to rattle about and be on the on the piss a bit there but to get it to sit at the right height so we're we're, we're making strides we're getting there that's one seat down one to go so having already talked to you about the ejection seats there's a little bit of an update here I did get them finished and posted them on Facebook whereupon the uh, customer for this model this is a commission build got in touch and said uh, you do realize you've painted the seats up in the style of the modern seats so the green belts are uh, GL4 modern uh, and this is a Golf 4 build so it actually needs tan belts so I went back and repainted the belts and while I was there I also replaced the ejection handle down here the seat pan firing handle because he didn't like the resin one felt it looked a little over scale which in truth it was um a little bit big so that was replaced with some wire simple little bit of wire and this is the seat as it as we have it now so both seats are now finished and i have put a small chunk on the bottom there of plastic card just to lift them up a bit because i felt that they sat a little bit low in the cockpit so there we have it two two little ejection seats resin with the lead foil belts and then with that done really it's moving on into the final stages the final obstacle for foxy now for before uh, actual assembly and little bits of bits and pieces of finishing off with the weathering is the undercarriage now I probably shouldn't really refer to it as an obstacle, it's all part of the deal. But honestly, these main legs have been a chore. Just quickly then, the nose leg is in situ already. Here we are. That is the kit nose leg. I did modify it, drill up through it with brass, as you've seen in previous episodes. And before fitting it, I did various details. I made a new landing lamp out of clear that was carved to shape. Um, and a bracket made up and that was fitted on there I'm just gonna move my lamp so I can bring it close and it'll still be lit up there we go made new uh, springs on that retraction arm and added a bunch of wiring this was all done with regard to the pictures in the book that I've been using throughout the whole build and that's then been set in place it does have the resin upper part of that retraction arm as well rather than the kit part so that's where we're at there with the main undercarriage bays obviously we've got these uh, resin bays but this part here where the leg actually glues in is sti still the original kit uh, and I noticed that it kind of just it flaps about it's fairly solidly flapping about but it sort of flaps about a little bit so what I've done is added some some glue into the edges here super glue and talc so it's naturally white 
just to steady those up because you could kind of push them in which obviously is going to um, affect the angles of the leg um, the rest of this at this point really is just waiting on final weathering which will happen once I get the pylons and the legs in place hence why I mention <laughs> the main undercarriage legs in terms of being an obstacle anyway why were they an obstacle? Well, uh, if you look back to previous episodes or think back if you can remember or if you have this kit if you're lucky enough to have this kit in the stash you can have a look but the, the original undercarriage leg features a separate part that fits there um, I don't have the plastic ones anymore I cut them up uh, it, and it fits into a large sort of aperture that's in this moulded area now this is the resin uh, strut from, from the undercarriage set and when I came to put it in position it just didn't fit at all, it wasn't positive, there was no positive location and there was a massive gap all the way around it the legs were already painted and I'd already done the foil on the, on the oleo here so it wasn't the most pleasing thing to find that it, it was all just wrong, I essentially had to start all over again, I had to I used the model itself I uh, mocked it all up using blue tack as best I could to set the angle of this and then glued it to the leg and then had to fill and smooth it because this, this area here is all part of this casting on the real thing, it's not separate pieces. Well, that obviously necessitated repainting the legs. Um, and when that was finally done to my satisfaction, I've, I've since added some wiring, which is the black that you can see, and the hydraulic lines which are white which go down to the extra detail that was added here just above oh I can't think backwards still just above the torque link there so the, the last thing to go on these legs now is the actual brake lines and anti-skid wiring which is quite prominent actually on, on the real aircraft and sort of goes around that torque link quite nicely let's grab a picture see in this photograph there's this wiring here is to go on but I don't want to put that on until the leg is in place and in fact the wheel is fitted because it's going to be super fragile talking of wheels here they are these have been painted and weathered the weathering is simply some wash that's just been dobbed on and mixed in and messed about with until it looks all right uh, I didn't want it to look like a wash, I wanted it to look like dirt and I think I've achieved that quite well. And on the back side, the brake packs were painted by hand with Mr Metal Colour Stainless and then that's also been weathered in for brake dust. The tyres have just literally had a little bit of uh, Tamiya, I'll grab it now, Tamiya Weathering Master. Now these are kind of kind of like pastels I suppose and you you just rub them on but they're quite useful for stuff like that um, I've long since worn out the brushes or the sponge pads in mine and I have to use whatever comes to hand now bits of foam, bits of packaging, paint brushes my finger features quite prominently <laughs> anywho this wiring was all done with the lead wire that you can see here this is 0.3mm plus model uh, lead wire and I don't suppose it's actually lead but it's some kind of soft material it's very very easy to shape very easy to form but you do have to be insanely careful with it and I don't know if you can see but the because it gets tangled up in the packet that it comes in it's got lots and lots of small sort of disturbances and irregularities and it's not at all straight so what I do before use is I cut off a piece that's plenty long enough for the job in hand and then I use the back of my scalpel handle just roll it over the wire like that and that just straightens it all out again um, but it's not the perfect material really in a lot of respects and, and uh, just that leads me into this which I've just picked up from models for sale uh, just come into the range it's this AK copper wire uh, this is 0.25 millimeters it comes in a few different sizes but you can also get it already black which is quite good I think so I picked up one of them for any future massively overblown detailed projects that I might do there's also 0.45 and then this I think this is probably enough for about 28 lifetimes 
but this is 0 0.07 and it's 20 grams worth and this is the sort of exceptionally fine uh, wire that you get if you strip cables this is clearly a lot easier than stripping cables so I picked that up as well so I think they'll probably be useful in the future but too late for this build anywho must get on but uh, I'll get the legs fitted and then that's the we're into the final stretch there for weathering and then into final assembly which is, is quite exciting to me to finally see this thing up on its legs and, and looking complete so be back soon and here we are then this is the last little bit got those uh, got those wires I did on the undercarriage and got the wheels on so it does now stand on its own four feet thus uh, and I've got the initial sort of pylons on and uh, weathering back here this this dirty bottom uh, I have obviously used reference photos here and also inspiration from a friend of mine who used to work on tornadoes until they stopped working um, you know specifically where leaks would issue from and so on and so forth and I've been building that up and just for interest's sake a, a, a point to make about weathering here this this is not the result of, of one application of one product this is many many layers and you can see there's a bit of a sheen there as well that's entirely deliberate these are oil leaks and thus for the most part unless they become completely engorged with soot or mud they still remain somewhat glossy so yeah this is a lot of layers <laughs> the metallic finish in the first place in these areas was a lot of layers and then there are several layers of various things on top of that so I'll just quickly sprint through what those things are for you and maybe at some point later and later on I'll do a, a more in-depth look at metallic finishes and weathering thereof but the the, met the metal areas were painted with either Alclad or AK Interactive Extreme Metal which is this stuff um, I think it's 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 kind of a lacquer based thing but I think they call it an enamel it it's uh, yeah high quality enamel based paint and it, it is thinnable with lacquer thinner and uh, sprays beautifully and for my money to be honest I prefer it than Alclad for most part anyway that's what these were painted with and then they were painted with this this Tamiya panel line accent colour which is an enamel based weathering product it comes with and brush in the lid and it was simply applied with that and then sort of left to dry in some areas it was blended out in others it wasn't and it just leaves this really really interesting and actually incredibly realistic finish that's then boosted if that's the right word by the grunge mix this is roughly 50 50 of black and xf64 tamir acrylic and 64 being the um, the red brown uh, massively thin just got a metal ball in it because I just keep on topping this up this bottle has been this jar has been in use for several years now you can see the color there and this is by a long way and without any any comparators to be honest to me this is the most realistic exhaust smoke medium I've, I've found but it also works for gun smoke and for general filth as well so that is then been layered onto these areas as well and this has taken process taken place over over many many weeks as well bear in mind because each layer really does need to dry uh, and then for this streaking which is so archetypal of tornadoes being the, the leak fest that they are again several layers but only really three main ingredients there is some of that grime mix in there but then it's built up out of oil brushes which have been thinned with enamel thinner and the ones that I have used are rust and Starship Bay Sludge and there's about five to six different layers here and those need to dry in between if you don't allow the layers to completely dry i.e. at least overnight then the subsequent layer will kind of pull it away and sometimes that works to your advantage sometimes that will give the effect that you want and sometimes it doesn't so be aware of that you need to leave at least overnight and preferably a bit longer sometimes in between these layers so as they don't just mix up into one big amorphous mess so there's about I think about two applications of each colour here gradually in different areas and it really starts from about up here and, and works back 
And the thing that's giving the gloss to it and, a, and another slightly different hue is this stuff. I'm of MIG engine fuel and oil stain. And this again is an enamel based product. It's obviously meant for armor models, but we don't want, we don't need to listen to that. And it's a glossy, quite thick, manky, very, very engine oil looking coloured stuff. Now, if any of you out there are aircraft engineers, don't sit there and shout at me because jet engine oil isn't the same colour as car engine oil, I do know that and that's why I've used the rust colour but the, the general effect when it's mixed with crap on the bottom of an aircraft does look kind of similar in most cases. Uh, equally query in the use of, of a colour named rust. Don't get carried away with what stuff's called, just look at the colours themselves and apply that to what you see on the real thing and use whatever looks as though it matches best. Don't worry about the fact that it says it's Kursk Earth or something. If it looks like it's the right colour for what you need, just use it. Anyway, that, that really brings this, this segment of, uh, of the Foxy saga to an end. I am now at the point where I can begin to really, really get into final assembly. If I just show you, I've got various trays with all of the other parts. That's all painted all ready to go on there you go still a bit of weathering to do here and there there's certainly some weathering on the top sides and indeed the the main Tonka fin exhaust stainage it's all to go on yet but we're basically on the home stretch um, so the next video you get in this series will be Foxy final and that'll be the reveal and a chat about what's gone on and what we think of the, fi of the finished model so that's it for this one chaps so until the next time we speak and look after yourselves look after each other and genesis out